Hi, my relatives. On today's episode of Our Storytellers, we're joined by Jay Lambert. Jay owns Jay Lambert Coaching and Consulting, where he coaches Indigenous leaders. Um, we talk a lot about accountability on this podcast. We we talk a lot about a wide variety of subjects in the in the coaching field. How to choose a coach is a subject that you'll get out of this podcast as well, too. So, um, without further ado. I, I say we'll we'll just get right into it. Uh, so please welcome to the podcast, my good friend, Jay Lambert. Hello, my relatives. How are you? Here at Our Storytellers, we care about your spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical well-being, which is why we want to inform you that this podcast discusses topics that may cause trauma to listeners and viewers. These subjects include mentions of Indian residential schools, assimilation, ongoing harm, colonial impacts, and much more. Our Storytellers recognizes the need to minimize risks associated with traumatic subject matter. The Hope for Wellness Helpline offers immediate help to all Indigenous people across Canada. It is available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, to offer immediate support in crisis intervention. Services are available in English and French, and in Nehio, Anishina Bemoin, and Inuktitut, Upon request, if you or someone you know are experiencing any harm, no matter how big or small it's perceived to be, you can call the toll-free helpline at 1-855-242-3310 or connect to the online chat at www.hopeforwellness.ca. Keenan Askeman, I'm grateful for you. Your ancestors are always with you. All my relations, Riel. What's uh, Jimmy Pattison here? Yeah, ninety years old. They're still working. Like I saw a picture of Jimmy Pattison at like some John Deere um, dealership because I th- apparently he owns those too. Um, <laughs> he's over, he's in his nineties and he's still out there. Like, and I'm like, he doesn't need to be working. Yeah, um, but he does it because I'm assuming he does it because he loves it. Like he doesn't need more money. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. It, that's interesting i mean i see myself in the same boat though at the same time because it's like i don't know i feel like working and accomplishing things can be really really fun if you're in the right conditions for it but at the same time if you're putting effort towards something and you see no yield or result i feel like that's one of the most demotivating factors at least for me personally yeah i, I i've heard many stories uh, i remember hearing it from my parents others it's like that transition to like you're you're a federal government worker or whatever you're that worker you've this is your life for 40 years or more and then you retire and you've been waiting for 40 years to retire often in those in, in those cases mm-hmm. um and then you're lost like you can only fish so much like my dad liked fishing but it's like you can only fish so much yeah and so what, what do you like so it's nice for a month, two months. I know I I get really antsy after a few weeks of nothing. Like I, I oh guess I need to rest, but at the same time, if once my energy is back and stuff like that, I'm like I got to do stuff. And so yeah, sitting around watching Netflix till I die is not not in blood. <laughs> not <laughs> not, uh, not a uh, yeah totally not for me. I mean, I don't know. Like you're. I don't know. I I personally believe that Creator put us here for a reason, and 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 living out the creation in in the best way you possibly can is like what I'm here to do. And with that note, I'm gonna pass over this blanket and tobacco oh. over to you, Jay. Thank um, you. Um, this is just to open up the lines of communication between you and myself and in our families as well too. Um, you know, I I have I have super high respect for you. I know I know you and I probably first kind of connected when we were working at FNHA just kind of in passing and stuff like that but I have massive respect for your career and and what you're doing and what you're doing today as well and uh, I just want to pass this over and open it up for you and please introduce yourself um oh I'll introduce myself too I <laughs> sure, guess I should yeah. probably say but um my name is Riel I'm cream AT from uh with some soda background as well too and uh yeah, please introduce yourself in, in any way you see possible. Sure. You see fit. Uh, well, my name is Jay Lambert. I'm uh, Métis Cree as well. My mom's French-Canadian. Uh, my family, my uh, father was born in Fort Vermilion. That's where my grandfather was a fur trader with the uh, Lubicon Cree and uh, for, uh, Hudson's Bay Company. 
Um, these are all things I just like, I knew my grandfather was a fur trader, but it didn't mean anything to me as a mm. kid growing up. My dad said, told, told me we were Cree park, park Cree, but that again, didn't mean a lot to when you're, when you're growing up because uh, we weren't practicing traditional in any way that I was aware of anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, and then probably much more French Canadian from my mom's French Canadian side. And uh, so I find that cool too, though. It's like, even on my mom's side, on my, my Europe, well, my mom's very European side, our, our ancestry goes back well before Canada. Mm. Um, but yeah, um, like my, there's a picture of my dad sitting on a big pile of furs and stuff like that. Like those are pictures I remember as a kid. Um, but it didn't really click in. It's like, okay, that's, that's the Coureur de Bois. Like that's, that's that ancestry that's coming through. Totally. Um, and, uh, and such. So I'm married. I've, uh, I've been just over 20 years. I've got three kids. Um, my daughter's, uh, 19 working at first nations health authority, which is, which is kind of surreal. Um, it was really weird when we actually were, com- when she first started working, we were actually commuting to work together, which mm-hmm. is just down the road. I'm like, okay, the, like one, she just had just started driving. So that was a little scary. Um, <laughs> but it's just like, <laughs> but it's just like, uh, I'm, I'm my, my little baby girl who's like used to be this big and is now coming to the office with me, not because I'm bringing her as a guest, but like she's working there. Um, my middle guy is graduating this year and my youngest is in, in grade 10. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, so that's, so I'm the oldest of five. So I come from, um, a a fairly large family. Uh, my mom's a one of eight. Um, and, uh, and I didn't find out till in my adulthood, but, um, when, uh, my dad didn't know either, but when the, uh, residential school, uh, the, what's the word, um, when it first kind of, there was a, a, claim uh then there was some opportunities there Um, my dad was just talking about it and my grandmother's like oh yeah well when i was at this at saint henry mission my dad's like what you you never told us um and that explains a lot though to like it one it was like all of a sudden like oh okay because by this point in time i'd actually been working with first nations for a while and it's just like oh okay well that explains a lot about my grandmother because she did have some challenges and stuff like that and and it's like, okay, now like things are starting to make sense. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, yeah, she's a, she's a residential school survivor because she did not, growing up, she wasn't Indian. She she was not like my grandfather was. I never met him. He died before I was born. Um, but she was, yeah, she was a result of that. It's like, no, it's not good to be an Indian. You got to, you got to, if you can blend in, blend in. And, uh, and that's what she did to, to the best of her ability. And, on, and um, so kind of sad, but at the same time, just, it's kind of, I'm glad that we got to find that before, um, before she passed a few years ago, she made it to 97. Mm. Um, but yeah, so that's, um, uh, professionally, I, I've been a professional floater. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I'm a generalist and I've, uh, it took me six years to do my undergrad. It took me. Um, and then I, 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 I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. And then I, I did land in, um, into economic development, uh, with Astalo Development Corporation. Um, then I got a fantastic opportunity to go overseas and I spent six months in New Zealand with the Maori on an internship, um, did a bit of everything. There. What were you doing over there? Uh, literally it kind of felt like everything. So I was helping them write proposals for government grants. I was doing, uh, tree planting of indigenous trees. I went on a whale flensing expedition. So whale flensing is when like, um, the, the Nadi Wai who I was with, um, they have a, a strong tradition of like using, well, whale, whale bones for tools, weapons, uh, all sorts of things, art. Um, but then it's also a source of food. Um, but they don't hunt whales, which is different from from up up our way. They they just collect what uh, what comes on 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 the beaches. Mm-hmm. Um, so they still so they have a, a, a traditional legal right to to those whales. So yeah, so a whale came up while I was there. Uh, so a big expedition went over, and it's like they they cut it all up and um, uh, wrapped up the bones, buried the bones to be buried for I can't remember how long, but um, it's part of the process of, of of drying them out and and making them ready for for use. Um, and yeah, just kind of whatever. I, I part of what I did, I, I have a diploma in geographic information system. So, and that was what they were really interested in. They wanted to like map out their territories and their their special sites and stuff like that. And they had huge dreams. I'm like, I can't do this in six months mm-hmm. um, <laughs> and stuff. So I, I'm like, okay, can we dial it back? And so I, I we did get some basic equipment and software and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, you need to hire somebody. And so my my work was um, was 
helping one of their community members who was kind of keen on computers and stuff like that, learn the systems, learn what it was about. So basically just imparting my knowledge mm. so that they can take it and, and go on. Fortunately, I have no idea if, how, how well it went after I left. Um, but that's my kind of philosophy with any kind of community development is, is, is how are we like, if I'm coming in from the outside, how am I, and as a consultant, um, how am I imparting capacity in the community? Mm-hmm. Um, how am I creating empowerment? Um, um, it's not just uh, a paycheck that I, I can, I can pull and then walk away from. Mm-hmm. So building off of that, what do you do today? So I am now uh, I'm coaching a consultant. Uh, I consider myself a, a, re, a transformation resilience coach, and uh, I particularly help uh, leaders, and ideally as much as possible, working with Indigenous leaders in um, supporting them in in working through the inevitable ad- adversity that comes um, without burning out. Uh, that's a big that's a big one for me because I'm um, I burned out myself multiple times. Uh, working with our communities, I see it all the time, especially with our health directors. But any of our, any of our leaders are are those who are kind of have some some capacity and they're able to really do stuff and they have a desire to help. Um, but then everybody comes to them to help. They don't get breaks. They may they probably don't have a good sense of how to um, set boundaries for themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they get fried and um, and then they're not and then they're not. Or, or their their capacity to help is greatly diminished, if not completely diminished. Um, <clears throat> I have a theory. Can I run a theory by you? you? I've, been, I've been saving it for you for a while. Awesome. But my my theory is that in in the work that we do, because you know I work pretty closely with communities and stuff like that too, is that you know our hearts are always kind of tied up into it, and then that also adds that one extra level of I would say emotional cost or you know that that level of impact, you know. And I, I think that that also might lead to some additional costs to the burnout bank. Does that make sense? Oh, for sure. Um, and I think, and and it's person. I think a lot of it's person. Well, it's probably there, personal. There, 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 there's there's family, obviously. Like that that is that is a big lever. But then there's also the personal. Some people are just much more empathetic. Mm. I, I wasn't one of those. I've worked, I had to work on that. <laughs> um, but some people are much more empathetic and they just, they feel other people's pain right. and you feel it even more when they're close to you, when they're family, when you've grown up with them. Um, so absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a tough area to, it's a fine line to walk um, between being able to be empathetic and compassionate, but, but not being so tied mm. to, what's going on with that other person that it's completely negatively impacting you. Like you're always going to carry some of it, but if you take it all on you're that, that's, so that's actually one of some of the things that, that often come up in, in the people I work with is it's just like even just separating that, um, it's like you don't want to be completely aloof and now whatever, but you also don't want to be so integrated with that person that like their pain is your pain, right. and you and you then become as as vulnerable as they are, um, and then you're not really as helpful. So you need to kind of find that balance right. of, of being in the middle. Is yeah, my thought. So what what are the like? How will I know if I'm burnt out? That's a good question. Uh, you're tired. Oh, so for me, um tired all the time like my lowest uh which lasted for uh, probably almost three four years um i would I, I i was like okay i'm gonna try intermittent fasting okay well no um and this that may this will make sense um but it's like no it's not really making any difference but i'm going to continue doing it because now i get 15 minutes more to sleep in the morning um so i would literally i would and then when COVID was hit it was like it was actually fantastic because it's like okay i can wake i can crawl out of bed 15 minutes before i have to go to work and i'm crawling out of bed at that time because i do not want to get up i it's a battle the only reason I'm getting up is because I have to go to work. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm, and I'm exhausted. I'm not function, um, brain fog. So I, when it was my worst, I was, I used to say I was, uh, I was operating about 75% of my previous capacity. Mm-hmm. Um, now that I'm a lot better, uh, I would say I was actually operating maybe at 50% capacity. So, um, I used to be, I used to work as a policy analyst for the Assembly of First Nations and I would get like 
all sorts of policies, legislation. I would review it and I could just pick part stuff, no problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in those years, it's like I would get a document and it'd be just like, looks good to me. I don't know. <laughs> and and uh, so so brain capacity. Um, but then, yes, on the back to the tiredness, I would then end up coming home and then or finishing work and then I'd go have a nap. And I'd be in bed and like, and I, then I'd get up for, for dinner, have dinner, and then I'd go back to bed. And then the weekend would come and I would sleep like Saturdays, I would sleep till noon, get up, eat something, go back for a nap and then get up maybe for a few hours in the afternoon. And then I would do the same thing on Sundays. And so, and no amount of sleep, like I would sleep 10 hours a night and nap during the day. Oh yeah. COVID, um, because I was at home. I go have a nap at noon. Like <laughs> mm. I'd eat lunch at my desk so that for my one hour off, I could go in and have a nap. Like I was just tired all the time. Wow. Um, then there's, all, uh, and I'm not sure how much of this was the burnout, but there's also, cause I was, I also had depression and anxiety. Um, and so I'm not sure how much of it was burnout and how much of it was the depression, but it's like, I was a bit of, I was a different person too. Like I was much more irritable um, much more easily triggered, uh, couldn't handle conflict. And I used to thrive on conflict. Like I used to just like throw me in coach. I'm, uh, I'll go and I'll go and argue with those, those federal bureaucrats. Like I, I, I loved it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I didn't love it, but I, I, well, actually I, in some ways I did like in university, my, my favorite thing was to hang out with my friends over a few drinks and yeah. we were a broad range of group of things. We would disagree on all sorts of things, sometimes kind of heated, but it was like, we always ended up friends at, like we were never, it never was personal. And, and I just, I thrived on it. Like, I'm like, I love learning. I want to know more about how that person's feeling. I want to know why they think that way. I may not leave agreeing with them, but now I have a better understanding. So, and I'm jumping all over the place here, Mm -hmm. but, uh, in a, in a nutshell, it was, it was really the fatigue and um and the brain fog and i still because i'm still battling with it i feel like uh it may never go away Mm. um but if i if i start to go oh i'm feeling good okay i'm gonna i'm gonna cheat i guess why i'm not drinking coffee today right um the caffeine caffeine impacts my adrenals and i love coffee um (laughs) (laughs) um, and i love carbs and carbs carbs cause inflammation for me and so i um i yeah i just uh, i have to stay away from those things um, but then every now and then I'll indulge and I'll be like, oh yeah, okay, I'm doing fine. And then I'll indulge a little bit more and not think too bad. And then all of a sudden it's like a week or so later, I'm like, uh, I gotta yeah. go back. It's like, I can feel the energy draining. Yeah. My brain's not functioning as well again. And so, um, I'm finding those, those indulgences are getting shorter and shorter because I'm like, no, it's not worth it. Yeah, totally. Your system is responsive to, to that environment. But so then what did the path to to, to looking better look like for you well looking better that was a just a bonus i just wanted my energy back yeah that's right <laughs> <laughs> feeling better feeling better yeah. um but yeah no uh um it, it was just it was just determination like uh i'm like i one i i've still my family still like my kids are still at home my wife needs support um because she's she's on disability and um and it's like i need to i need to get better but mostly i'm like i don't like, I don't want to, if I keep going this way, um, I'm going to basically just barely function to 65 and then I'll probably either die or be put into care because I feel like the way that I was, the track I was on from a health perspective is I don't have long for this world if I, if I, cause I'm, again, I'm, I can't, I'm sleeping all the time. I can't exercise, like I can't move, I can't do stuff. And so it just, it was, so I just, there was a, there was a perseverance that was, that, that kept me going. Um, and, uh, fortunately I have a, uh, still, still seeing him occasionally, uh, but a fantastic psychiatrist, um, who also, and I hear they're not doing this much anymore, but, um, he also is like, I would have my half hour session. So, but 20 minutes of that was actually just conversation and counseling and then he would be like, okay, where are we at with your medications? Like based on that conversation. Mm-hmm. So it was, what I'm hearing is I think, so unfortunately, psychiatrists are getting more medication focused. And that could be okay if we have a team environment where there's counselors attached to it and they're having a conversation. Anyways, um, 
experimenting with him and it's like okay this is this like my stability is sliding again and stuff like that it's like okay we need to find need to find something else um and so uh landed on a medication combination that just gave me enough boost that i was feeling good enough to kind of go okay i can take on some new things to try to feel better Mm. um and not directly, but directly, but not well, indirectly was at that, at that same time, I got the opportunity to do coach training. Right. Um, my VP uh, at First Nations Health Authority, um, huge proponent of coaching, uh, was, had done coach training herself, was on, on her track to getting uh, accredited. Um, and so, uh, so it wasn't too difficult to get her to support me in, in getting my coach accreditation. Um, and so part of the accreditation is you got to put in hours Mm. and, um, and, uh, one of the, uh, uh, ways that you can do hours is like, okay, well, you, you have, you have to, uh, 75% of those hundred hours. So 75 hours have to be paid. Um, but paid doesn't have to be cash. It can be, it can be a gift. It can be an exchange. Mm. Um, and, uh, I also happened to be posting more online because I was just, I decided, uh, I, I don't know what prompted me, but I came across a, a LinkedIn sprint. And so I, I posted 30 days and, uh, and that was really good. Cause that was like, I can be creative and I can turn out content for 30 days. I got burnt out after that, but <laughs> felt really sick. But, right. um, um, but anyways, in doing that, I also learned it's like the, the value of commenting on other people's other people's stuff for relationship building, but it mm. also helps them and all these other things. So um, I noticed a friend of mine from university was posting uh, on on her business and she's she's been a personal trainer. We met at Simon Fraser doing uh, in kinesiology. Um, she pursued that direction. Uh, turns out she's now uh, that that's her specialty is burnout, per- predominantly in premenopausal women. Um, but uh, the she's she's got like uh, that that's her niche area. Mm. But uh, she we started talking and I was just kind of like, hey, would you be? And she was talking about wanting to expand her business, so I was like, hey, do you want to exchange um, exchange coaching? And she was like, yes. And so that's that's what we did. Um, and uh, yeah, so. Practically speaking, it was diet and uh, diet and exercise. So she put me on uh, slowly. I, I started off on on low carb, but then I graduated to like high protein keto, mm. um, lots of fluids uh, and and not just water, but actually um, like salt water with lemon, because uh, just water doesn't absorb as mm. as, as readily into your body. Um, and uh, it was it the first month was a little rough. Um, but then all of a sudden, I think around week six, it was like a miracle. Like I actually was shocked at how well I felt. Um, and, uh, I was just, I was buzzing and people were like, what, like, what the hell? Like, this is, yeah. this is not the J well, if, if the one, the people that knew me long enough and were like, Hey, Jay's coming back. And the ones that hadn't known me through that are like, who, who the hell is this guy? Yeah. Um, and yeah, I proceeded to lose 40 pounds. My brain capacity, I, I still feel like I've got about maybe 5% more. I've got to work on that. Like that. Um, I still struggle to read. Mm. Um, but, uh, I'm, yeah, my, my, my capacity, like I'm not sleeping. I'm, I'm sleeping seven, eight hours a day now. And I'm not having naps every day and, and I'm functioning and, um, and probably the most important one though is, is, um, my wife and my kids like me better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what? Uh, sorry. Go no, for it. no, go, yeah, no, I, that, that's, yeah. I, I was just going to ask him <clears throat> how much of your, how much do you, do you include in that, in taking care of that physical area of your life in your coaching? I would say a, a big part. Um, uh, the language that that my coach used with me in certain things, uh, I, I may not necessarily use it this way, depending on who I'm working with. Um, but often, like I'd be talking, and she would just like uh, she would just say, "Is this um, is this victim Jay or is this empowered Jay?" Mm. And it'd be just like, "Ah, oh, crap! Like this is victim Jay talking." Mm. And so, and just that awareness that I was I was talking in a victim mode. And when you're in a victim mode, you're, you don't have any power. Everything's just happening to you. You're kind of, you're kind of stuck and it's, it's, I find it's depressing. It's hopeless. Um, so when you look at it as like, okay, how can I be move into a, okay, I may not be able to change the situation. Mm -hmm. Um, but how can I respond to it? 
Um, so it's a mindset shift and that's, and that's a lot of coaching is, is, is when, when I'm working with someone, um, noticing the language that they're using, um, noticing, uh, noticing when they're kind of like all of a sudden, or maybe their, their, their energy is shifting, their, the demeanor is shifting, um, because something and, and just kind of digging into there and it's like, so the victim is, there's a story I'm telling myself. So what's that story? It's like, oh, the story is like, oh, this is happening again. I, I can't do this. I like, I'm stuck. I'm never going to get out of this. Um, but when you shift that, that mindset and it's like, okay, um, well, maybe I can't get out of this situation. Like my, my, my wife's probably going to be on disability forever. She's got some health issues that are probably never going to go away. Um, but if I come at it from, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm a smart guy. I, I can figure things out. Um, uh, I'm resilient and such. I was like, that's a much different way to approach things. And then all of a sudden options just start to open up mm -hmm. is, is, is what I find. So and, it seems like, it seems like you're changing the internal language or you're helping someone help them change that internal language that they're speaking to themselves. That's all. That's probably almost 90% of it. Wow. Cause the reality is we, and uh, so a philosophy that mo many, most of the coaches I know use is like when I'm coaching you, I see like as a coach, I see you and I, I'll tell you, I see you as creative, resourceful and whole. You've got everything you need to, to, to figure this out. I'm just here to, to, to be basically create a space for you to process and ask, ask you questions to help you kind of dig deeper. Um, and it, it's, it's, uh, and so you already know, and often like you, it can even be conscious, like often it's unconscious, but sometimes it's even conscious, but until you process it with somebody. So one, I do remember one particular time with my coach, um, something was going off. I don't remember exactly what, but I was just like, I was, I was triggered. I was not doing well. And I'm like, I, I'm like, I need to talk to you today. And she's like, yep, yeah, no problem. Like, can we'll talk there in like a few hours or whatever. And, um, but I knew before I even picked up the phone with her, I'm like, I know what I need to say and I know what's going on and I know what she's going to say, but I need to like, I needed to have that conversation. And as soon yeah. as I started talking to her, I was like, okay, poof, that, that kind of let go. Um, so there's a power there in that, um, in that relationship that, um, that, uh, was, was really helpful because, um, you might be able, you might know something, um, but you can still be stuck in it. Like you can still be, it's like, okay, I know, like, who doesn't know that exercise isn't good for us? Mm. Like, but I even was at a point because of my burnout is like, I, and I, I used to be a cross, I didn't throw this in, but I, I used to be a, a CrossFit coach, mm. loved exercise. And so I'm not somebody who's never done it. I know how good it f can feel. I enjoyed doing it, but I had got to a point where it's like, I can't get myself to do it. And I did get to a point where it's like, doctors would say, it's like, um, you need to exercise. I'm like, yep, yeah, not going to happen. Cause and it wasn't because I didn't want to, it wasn't because I didn't believe it was valuable, but it was because I knew where I was at, there was something else, but I didn't know what that was. Mm. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's what's, what's, and I know a lot of people get stuck on this, like, okay, I know exercise is good for me, but I can't do it for X, Y, Z. Mm. And so as a coach, it'd be like, okay, well, let's, let's dig into that a little further. Like what's, what's the story that you're saying? Okay. Well, you some of, some cases is like you had tons of bad experiences with sports as a kid in school. Like some people just really don't like that. My, my wife's actually one of those. Um, or you have some, some issues and stuff like that. And it's like, okay, well then let's shift at what you can do. Like, let's not like, we don't, you don't have to go run a marathon. Um, but like, you like going for a walk. My wife loves <clears throat> going for walks. Like, so that's, that's what, that's sort of those things. Like what, and you take those steps slowly yeah. and, and I think that's a big thing too, is we, we're, we're a culture uh, and, and I think in general, well, I don't, we're a culture right now of instant gratification. Yeah. And if it doesn't have something, cause I, oh, I remember when my coach said this might, um, she di she diagnosed me even though she can't do that. Um, but I agree with the, the, her diagnosis is that I had adrenal fatigue syndrome. Um, and she's like, it's going to take you six to nine months, maybe a year to get out of this. And I did. And when she said that, I was just like, I don't want to hear that. Yeah. Like, I don't want to hear that. Like, that's too long. Um, but then it's like, well, what's my option? Like, so it's like, I, I'm either continuing down this path or I, I'm, I'm taking this 
10 month journey to to and it ended up being about nine months and honestly i'm not really out of it i'm still dealing with it because like i said i've if i have i was going to go to honey's donuts after this and i'm like no because then i'm going to eat that and that's going to crash me like even as tasty as they are right so um I'm still having to make difficult decisions on, okay, do I want that yummy treat or do I want to feel good? Right. Okay. I got so many questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'll still, yeah. <laughs> but uh, so <clears throat> at least for me anyway, I love exercise. I don't think I would have anything without it, to be honest at this point. But I had a really, really good role model growing up because my dad like loves it to the day to this day still mm-hmm. six years old he still goes to the gym so i had a really great role model and someone to learn from you know <clears throat> when i am talking with my friends because you know me and the guys all get together and we have like our 20 minutes of macho fest or whatever <laughs> you know what i mean and 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 we come together and i feel like when it comes to at least for me personally what i try to do always is like and and i'm i'm asking for your opinion on this is i always try to set myself a goal that is achievable that's just that would make me feel uncomfortable enough to feel proud that i did it but not so uncomfortable that i would not want to do it does that make sense yeah no i think that's that's i'm in line with that as well yeah like uh, i have i have some goals that have just been out of reach for decades honestly um but I'm not giving up on them. Like they're, it's just like, okay, well things happen that got in the way of them. Mm. Um, but yeah, no, you start and it's, uh, I think what's important for me and I'm, I'm actually working to relearn this is, um, loving the process. Like it's, it's like, okay, I, 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 I fell down on that or I didn't, I didn't get it. It's like, but it's, um, and then, uh, it's like, actually enjoying the learning and it's and not seeing it as a failure actually i just had a chat with this about with one of my clients is it's like don't look at that necessarily that particular issue as a failure um it's it's an opportunity to learn it's Mm. feedback it's it's stuff that you can now go back and it's like okay don't do that again or whatever that whatever the lesson is from that um because you can't go back and change it um and then so but if you take it as it's a failure often when we say failure then we internalize it and then it becomes i'm a failure um and so we really want to stay away from that totally yeah what uh what what would you recommend for a who's a person or an organization who's maybe seeking out some coaching you know you mentioned indigenous leaders preferably if i'm an indigenous leader what should i be looking for in a coach for myself that's a really good question because it's really personal, mm. um, and I, I. But that makes it fair uh, on, at that end too, though. It's um, just try. Um, most coaches I know will offer, like I offer, uh, a free, um, a free first session, and the whole point of that is is to provide somebody with the experience. Like, if a lot of people also don't know really what coaching is, so in, um, in in the context that I do it, um, but it's like let's get together let's have a conversation uh, i'll let you know like a little bit like let's let's get to know each other a bit um and then uh and then i'll offer them like just a 15 20 minute session of it's like okay you got something that's on your mind right now that you need a little bit of help with and we'll just work through that and then and then from that you kind of get a pretty good idea it's like okay is this going to be for me like is this person going to is this person going to be a fit for me if, and and that's for me as well because i i don't want to work with just anybody i want to work, work with people that i think are going to be well one are coachable um some people might get a coach but then they're not willing to be accountable like i'm not a coach isn't in my world is not i'm not there to hold you accountable that's your job i'm just here to help you find that path mm. and then the accountability is on is on you you're i it seems like you're super appreciative about accountability or you're, you think about accountability often i feel like it's a all large theme. the time yes <laughs> tell me more uh I think it goes back to the day it, 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 when I think I, right, what comes up for me immediately is just my days working uh, with the First Nation Chiefs Health Committee as as an e-health coordinator, but working with communities. A lot of the work I got involved in, but I heard it all the time, was um, communities were just buried in report writing. Like they, they felt like they were and probably were. I, I didn't work in those, but actually I'm sure they were. Um, they're spending as much or more time writing their reports on what they were doing than what they were actually supposed to be doing. And 
but and then these f- reports would get sent to the federal government and then it was kind of like and then what like what was the purpose of that what was like and so the term the term uh, at least i became familiar with the term around that time called the reciprocal accountability um and so it's like okay you know what your government are telling me we need to be accountable for the money that we're spending and that's and i'm that's fair like uh, there's money's coming here let's we need to make sure it's being spent appropriately what have you then no problem with that but what's your accountability back to us like when you're asking for all this information that and i can i i can vouch for it does not make any sense like mm. what are you getting from this information um and like so uh we need like you need to have some accountability back to us and transparency is like why is this like what's important about this information why are you collecting this information and that's actually inherent in our like in our privacy legislation like you're not allowed to collect information without a valid reason mm. like, you have to have a valid reason within to collect any piece of information personal information um and so there's there is there's there's it's not just a, a a little isolated thing it's kind of a you don't ask unless there's a purpose in in these kind of things and so that's 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 sort of where it began um i think a lot of it too is my upbringing it's like my both my parents were hyper independent it's like you need to take care of yourself for me it was a bit too much because i i didn't know how to ask for help when things mm-hmm. really hit the fan um but it's like i'm responsible like if i uh, if 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 I crash the car, that's me. And I did do that. <laughs> it's like I, I, it's me for speeding, driving recklessly and everything like that. Nobody else's fault. Um, and as such, I accepted, I have to accept the consequences. And that was kind of, that was something I was like, okay, you know what? You did that. And then like, if fortunately it never happened for me, but like if I had found myself in jail, I did sit in the back of a police car once. Mm-hmm. Um, but my dad would be like, well, you, you've, you got yourself there. Like, he would he would be supportive and he loved me but at the same time it's kind of like well you put yourself there what are you going to do to get out um and i do remember actually now um sinking my car in the river once and uh and yeah calling him on the payphone he's like well you got out there you got friends like <laughs> you know, i'm not, <laughs> I'm, not co- I'm not coming to get you it's probably <laughs> was it, it and i'm thinking like he wouldn't have had anything to pull me out anyway so um and i did i figured it out and and there's a sense of pride that comes from that too. Like in the moment, I'm like, "What the hell, Dad? Like you're you're leaving me out in the middle of Chilliwack River, like Lake Road, and <laughs> in the middle of nowhere." But it's like it's not like I'm alone. It's not like uh, so. I, I I don't want to paint my dad with a bad. Like I know my dad loved me, but at the same time, it was very much as like, "Okay, you know what? You're 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 an adult now." Like I was in my early twenties. I was like yeah. probably twenty one, twenty two, and it's like you figure it out you you're not you're not dumb like he didn't say it that way but it, it was that's that's how i'm looking at it now um and then uh and then, so that's what kind of always carried and then it was reinforced actually particularly with my time at first nations health authority like there there's there's a big uh, mural that they have somewhere oh, I don't, it's not a mural but i know there's a big poster of like when when the people do the graphic arts and it's like it starts with me mm. and so coming into first nations health authority most i'm going to assume most people that are working there i know it was for me is like i want to make a difference in the communities i want to help okay that's great lots of people want to help but have i started with myself first like am am i healed am i am i healthy am i good Um, because if i'm not my i might be able to do some but i can't really do a lot Mm -hmm. until i've taken care of myself and it's the old, um, I don't, I haven't come across a better one yet, but they, they talk about the airplane. It's like, you put your mask on first, because if you don't, then like you, you want to put it on your kid first, but probably what will end up happening is you won't even save your kid. You're, and you're both going to die. So, um, really that kind of like taking care of yourself yeah. can be selfish, but generally like, but it's if it's about taking yourself so you can live up to your responsibilities and accountabilities, that's a different story. What are some of the benefits that like being an accountable person can do for an individual? Oh, okay. Well that's, yeah. Just being accountable is, um, well, it builds your trust. Like we talk about like in our communities anyways, I hear it all the time. It's all about relationships. And I, and I, to me, that's everywhere. It doesn't matter where you go. Mm-hmm. There's a book that I've, I've heard, I've yet to read it, but I've heard it referenced multiple times. It's like the speed of trust. Uh, I think it's Stephen Covey and, and talks about like, uh, 
a high trust organization versus a low trust organization. And a high trust organization doesn't even need policies, is kind of what he's saying. Um, a low trust organization needs tons of policies because you need to control and you need to set the things and you need to have those boundaries. But a high trust is like, I know you're going to get it done. And so if you've got high accountability, then that's an integrity. And actually, yeah, that's going back to my, like, even my, my coach is like, is I then increase my trust in myself that I can do things. And so your capacity to do things increases by having that accountability as, uh, and I'm, as I'm saying, and it like, sounds a lot like discipline. Yeah. Um, cause it is like, they're, they're very intertwined when you think about that. Um, but if I'm being accountable at you, like, so I showed up on time. Um, <laughs> like if I'm being accountable and to my word, to you, to whoever else, to myself, um, that increases the trust. Well, then you increase the trust, the relationship improves. Uh, once the relationships improve, the ability to do stuff just increases exponentially. Right. Like, so another area I'm, I'm moving into is coaching teams. Um, and a lot of that is about, um, well, one, a lot of it is, is just, okay, do we even know where, like, let's, let's have a conversation. Do we even know where we're all going? Cause that's often a problem. It's yeah. like, okay, I'm working in this way, this way. We're all supposed to be going here, but we're actually one's going to, and really fits with the, like we, we talk about in first nations communities, Métis is like, okay, are we all paddling in the same direction in our canoe? Right. Um, and knowing this, like, okay, you're paddling and you're not paddling in the opposite direction, or you're not just dipping your paddle and not actually pulling. Um, that's, I, I think that's, that's a, a key piece. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question that well, so I'll just stop there. No, 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 that totally <laughs> answers it. Um, so you, you talked about those high trust organizations and those low trust organizations. What was your experience like working in, in healthcare for s- for so long and, and being able to contribute to that. Did you find that? Cause we, I work in healthcare today. I would say that like for me personally, my perspective is that, you know, most of our healthcare organizations are, are kind of low trust organizations in my perspective. What do you think about that? I would say yes. And, and I would extend that to my experience working with federal and provincial governments. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's it's all um it's not all but it's often um we need to regulate you we need to regulate how you do things we need to and it's it's very command and control um but a high trust is like and then when but when and i don't know about you but and i and i'm gonna assume most people but like i don't like being told what to do Mm. um like just especially if i don't understand why or if i and so uh, and and if I'm not feeling heard, well then I I can tell you I'm I'm one of those I'm one of those people I have read the policies, and if there's a loophole I'll figure it out. And and, and even worse though for a few of my supervisors is, um, you might be telling me that it's a policy, but then it's not. Um, and so I will call you out on it. And mm-hmm. I have done that. It's like okay, it's in the policy. It's like no, it's not. Yeah. It's like, yes, it is. I'm like no, it's not. Mm, here here's the policy highlighted thing. Nope. And and so and that's. And while that's something I, I've kind of been proud of myself for, but it's like at the same time, it's like, okay, that erodes the trust between the two of us. Like, mm-hmm. And so now we're battling over policies rather than, okay, what are we supposed to be doing? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and But yeah, government, it's like when communities get funding, it's like got all these criteria and it's, um, I got really good and I, I, and I feel like most people, proposal writers to the government got are pretty good at just like okay this is the policy this is the this is the criteria but this is what we need to do um so we will write the proposal as best we can to touch it as best we can but also give ourselves enough leeway to actually do what we need to do mm-hmm. um and so there's a there's like a creativity that actually needs to happen but like because if you just took it as is uh you uh, you you just wouldn't be able to use the money or you would be using the money in a completely different direction and leave yourself open to okay um it's not like to it's like well you didn't do what we said with the money so now we're going to take it back and that's a that's a problem Mm -hmm. how do you uh how do you bring culture and ceremony into your coaching it's very individual and um but I, i knowing that uh well 
in the conversations with the with the people that I'm working with, the uh, a question that will come up is is like what what practices um, do you have that that could be useful for you in in this space? So, um, like so, when I work with uh, with the Maori, uh, so I'm I'm a, a co facilitator and, and I'm doing some work with uh, Tahi, who is uh, my training organization, and every every session starts off with karakia, so prayer. Um, and that's, that's, that's like a, that's a, that's a given we, you do that, um, that, so that's an option, but, uh, here in BC with all the different cultures and all the different people are kind of in different places. Uh, it's more of an invitation. It's like, if you've got something that, that helps you. So my question will often be like, cause often, <laughs> often they'll come in and they're just like, okay, I just had this, this, and this It's like, okay, what do you need right now to just take a few minutes and get grounded so that that you're good and if, if that's culture like if that's if that's smudging um, I had one person actually just turn off the camera and disappear for like five minutes um, to do a meditation uh, which because I was in my early coaching at that time I'm like okay this is weird I'm getting paid to just be staring at a blank camera uh, but that's what they needed and and then when they came back they were in a place to have the conversations to do the digging and stuff like that so if I had tried to just push them through, then the quality, like if we got anything out of it, cause they were in such a tizzy, um, uh, it would have been lower quality mm -hmm. than what, what lower value to them than that. So it, it's totally open. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's totally open. So it just, it seems like, <clears throat> it seems like just the general theme here is that coaching is very, very individual and coaching is designed to meet you where you're at at that specific moment if you're coachable 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah so like even the questions like i am uh, that i'm asking i'm like we have an innate desire to help um and so often we're problem solving in our heads and and especially if we're in the same similar field or we have similar experiences it's like oh yeah okay i've, I've had that experience i can share my knowledge but that's not what coaching is about in the world i work in it's about um, it's about, again, going where the person's at and with what they're at and letting them come up with what they need. So uh, always asking permit, like if something comes up and it's like, okay, I feel like I, I should bring this up. So I ask permission. It's like, can I bring, can I, um, something's coming up for me. Can I share that? And then it's like, is there anything like, does that bring up anything for you? Yes. Okay. Well, let's, let's explore that. No. Okay. No skin off my back. Like really, really putting it in, mm -hmm. like really being there to serve the client is, is the, is, is that, is that key thing. So not leading, asking questions. Like we can, we like to do that sometimes too. It's like, you ask a question, but you, you ask the question because you know, it'll take them in the direction you want them to go. Right. Um, and so being as a coach, being mindful that I'm not asking leading questions, I'm asking very new neutral we call them clean questions mm -hmm. um so it's like uh and even things staying away from like s potentially judgmental questions so why how um so kind of focusing more on what like what were you like what are you feeling or what happened and and stuff so it's not like again trying to move away the judgment trying to really come from a place of curiosity mm -hmm. uh, and an opportunity so they go so then you're not leading. They go where they need to go because um, I don't know where they need to go. Interesting. What <clears throat> What do you think that like uh, indigenous professionals or indigenous leaders should start actioning or focusing on today? Because the reason why I ask that question is because you have such a diverse set of experiences over, over your career. And then on top of that, you're now coaching and training our leaders. What does that look like to you? I think, yeah, the, the first most important to me anyways, is that are you taking care of yourself? Mm. Um, and I guess that leads to like, for me, I think the number one thing for our first, our, our indigenous leaders, but just anybody like yeah. in, right from an, an, an individual and everybody's a leader in my mind um, is self-awareness, mm. like understanding uh, understanding yourself and I and to me that's a lifelong journey too because as you start to figure things out well then new layers approach and then as you those new layers approach go in different directions but um self-awareness is like okay what am like one like from from a health perspective it's like what energy levels do i have to do this like do i have the capacity of like should i be saying no um um 
one that came up actually just recently is it's like okay i'm in a space where this is my community but i'm here as as a, in a particular role um that's not a community role so how do i navigate that and so again self-awareness is like understanding the the protocols understanding the responsibilities of that thing but then also understanding their other responsibilities and then learning how to communicate that and so when they're communicating having self-awareness around how, how do they come across um is 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 uh is stuff because um leadership is like people there's management and then there's leadership and managers they tell people what to do leaders inspire followers is to me is how i like to think of leadership is it's not somebody who has authority or power but it's somebody like real leaders don't aren't leaders because they hold a position or they hold a title like it's because they are inspirations people trust them they they have knowledge and experience that it's like okay I'm, i want to follow you but then they also know enough to know that they need to listen to their community members their team members whoever it is that's that's part of it because they have the self-awareness to know that they don't know it all um, that they might be an expert in one thing but then then their teammate or community member is an expert in another and another and another um, and that's a good team that's a good organization that's a good community when you have this diversity um and then and the, in that and those those individual diversities are it's like okay well i might be really weak in this but that person's really strong in it so that's that's going to be that person's role and so i'm going to as a leader i'm going to lean on that person rather than just trust my own knowledge mm -hmm. even though i might know nothing about that mm -hmm. And that was actually one of my early teachings working with communities is like, okay, you're, you're coming into a community, you're coming into a First Nations organization or First Nations uh, community. Um, the people that I might be working with might have quite likely have no degrees, no like limited education and stuff like that. But that does not mean they don't know anything. They know a lot, especially about their community. Absolutely. And so having, I guess, uh, another area uh, it's just humility to to know to acknowledge again self awareness is, is is tied into the humility but self awareness is like okay um, that person knows a whole lot that I don't and even if I'm not sure where the connection is and maybe the particular work um, approaching it is like I'm going to see what I can learn from this person rather than I'm going to see what I can teach this person or I'm going to how am I going to make this person do what I need them to, to do right right so. Just to sum that up, working on taking care of yourself is, is step one. For me, that's number one because, again, I, I've burnt out multiple times. I see it all over the place. I hear about it. Some people have fantastic amounts of energy, um, but eventually they do seem to crash. What's some of your wellness practices? What works for you? Uh, for me, uh, it's uh, currently I, well, I get up early, uh, not because I love getting up early, but I, I, I get up early because I have a, a, a routine now that I do before I start anything else. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, healthy breakfast fluids. So I, you might hear it's like, a, so I, I'd have a big glass of water right. with lemon and, and salt. Um, uh, but then I, I, I take some time and I spend in prayer, but I, and I also go for a two and a half kilometer walk uh, around the neighborhood mm -hmm. um, every morning. So I've already done that this morning before coming mm -hmm. here. Um, uh, so there's, the, um, and then I, and then I come back in and I actually have a little bit of a workout routine that I do just right in the office. Um, and it's kind of just movement and mobility. So I used to do the CrossFit high intensity, heavy lifting and stuff like that. Now I'm focusing more on just, um, putting my body into weird places, like kind of like I wouldn't it's not really yoga it's not yoga but it's it there's there's aspects of like it's like a strengthening core mm -hmm. breathing and and flat, just being able to move um because that as I'm getting older is really important for me it's like I just again they, they say sitting's the new smoking I don't I think it's something else now but they have said sitting's the new smoking and mm -hmm. it's because your body's not moving and I think yeah just to use it or lose it um being mindful of yeah of just where my energy like again self awareness is like where are my energy levels tanking um, and so and then when that's happening having a plan so um, 
yesterday my 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 energy was tanking I went for a nap I don't have a nap every day anymore which is nice but I needed one and I think I only slept for 20 minutes but then I woke up it's like okay all my all my like irritability was gone I was ready to take on things again so um a, a nap might be it um again what what is what you need um I th- and I think, yeah, and then the mind spirit, though, is, is really, really analyzing those thoughts. Um, it's like, what am I, what's the story I'm telling myself? What's the, um, and how are those thoughts serving me? Um, or like, are they just winding me up and, and making me angry? And maybe there's like, and we always can justify those thoughts. Um, but are they fully true? Um, even if they are, are they, is it serving you to hang on to that? Um, so that, yeah, from a kind of a mind spirit. Um, so, and effectively it's cognitive behavioral therapy is it's like, okay, um, here's the thought I'm having. Is that true? Um, catastrophizing is my wife's favorite. Uh, that's one of the categories mm-hmm. of cognitive behavioral, um, black and white thinking is another, is another one. It's like, it's like, it's either this or this. And it's like, well, not always like sometimes, but often there's, there's some, there's some gray areas in there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, we're pretty much, we're pretty much <laughs> rocking, ready to rock here. But what does, let's just touch on culture quickly. Here. Sure. What, what does ceremony look like to you and what does culture mean to you? That's a good question because I haven't, I, I, I haven't been raised in the Métis culture. So to my, have you jigged well, before? Nope. Uh, and in fact, uh, like, uh, well, yeah. And, and when I would go, I almost hate to say this, but it's like, I, I actually don't connect with the Métis culture that well. And I'm not, sure really where that comes from that's okay um and yeah no and i'm I'm, I'm not i'm um but uh so and i'm saying that to say that for me and and it is my metis culture is is that um entrepreneur as that voyageur that was traveling the the trader yeah um and so we uh not so much the settlements and the communities um, but that living in the two worlds. Um, and so for me, uh, culture and stuff is it, when I'm living my Métis roots um, is when I'm like when I'm in New Zealand, I'm learning as much Maori as I can. I'm picking it up as much as I can yes. because, because that's that's who I'm working with is is the thing. So I'm like my backgrounds, my ancestry is Cree. But I've grown up on on Stalo territory. Yes. Um, so I know way more Halkamalem than I know Majef. Um, not and that's not saying a lot, but <laughs> <laughs> but I do. But like I I know a lot. Like I know a lot more Halkamalem than I know Majef. That's that's just a fact. That's just a fact. And that's because for me it's important because I'm working with those. I'm living in the territory. I'm working with those communities. Um, when I was working more nationally, it's like, okay, well, I'm uh, kind of whatever is the, the prevalent language that's being used um, will be probably what I'll pick up on. Um, so if I happen to be in an area where most people are speaking Majif, then absolutely I'd be working on that. Um, but I, I, I kind of just, I, I, I work to connect with the communities that I'm working with. Um, and for me, culture is really walking those two worlds and trying to take the best from both worlds, because um, there, yeah, there's 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 good and bad on both sides, and I and I think there's lots of opportunity um, to to have a best of both worlds. I could not have said it better <laughs> myself. You know, I think that might be this might be the first conversation I've ever had where I've actually, as Métis person to another Métis person, I've kind of aligned on how we see us as Métis people. For me, what you just described is the is what being Métis really means is that that level of effort that that voyageur spirit paired with taking care of your of the indigenous communities that are around you at that moment in time that's how i feel about it anyway that's why i'm so passionate about the like like on this podcast we interview a lot of you know squamish nation residents so i'm really passionate about ensuring that my local land where this podcast is being filmed is is represented here mm-hmm. and that's a metis thing to me yes exactly that's the exact that's it that's exactly it because as a metis person i, I would sure well as a metis 
my Métis ancestry, again, we traversed many communities and cultures and, and such, and we would adapt and, and I don't want to say conform to, but we would integrate. And again, integrate is different. I, I, I'm always careful to make sure integrate is not assimilate. Yeah. Um, integrate is connect, work together. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, there's some language learning and stuff like that. And that's, and that's how, that's how we survive. That's actually how Canada came to be because of, and sadly it got wrecked, but it was that strong relationship that was actually happening between the the Europeans and the indigenous. It's like, okay, um, yes, we're kind of foreigners, but we weren't, I don't think we were impacting them negatively too much. In fact, we, we were bringing stuff that had value to them. Like that's, that's there was, um, as I say that though too, I, I do have to admit that my, um, I, my, my grandfather, my dad found a book, was reading about the Lubicon Cree, um, and the missionaries uh, called out my grandfather because he was a thorn in their side because he was bringing booze to the like he was bootlegging. Right. Um, so there there was harm, but the the intent of of the trade though was it's like okay, like let's pots, pans, tools, guns, like things that make your life that can make your life easier yeah. and stuff like that. Like it it, it wasn't in. Um, I don't want, I, I'm saying it wasn't intended to, I, I, it was never intended to be harmful. Mm. Um, and unfortunately intentions don't, uh, good intentions do not always translate to, um, to positive outcomes. Uh, that's actually another thing I've learned because in, in my work is it's like, you can have the best of intentions, um, but you can still have a very negative impact. And so that's something I've worked with a lot of people on both sides is like you can come into our communities with the best of intentions, but the way you're doing it is actually harmful. And then same, even sometimes with our communities, it's like, okay, you're, you're really passionate about this and stuff like that, but you're, you're actually bringing something that's going to cause like, I'm thinking some of the researchers I've worked with mm -hmm. um, because they're so passionate about their thing. They kind of throw everything. And again, I, I, I would agree with what their general premise was, their general work was, but the way they were bringing it in because they were so encompassed by it that they were th like basically trampling other things that it's like, okay, yeah, like if you could just navigate a little better and yeah. I can help you with that. But if you're, <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, even going back, like, like back to the thing about like the trade, like the trade was, was mutually beneficial. You know, there's so many stories about, you know, settlers coming here and, and getting sick because they had no access to vitamin D and then the nation's helping support that. And like that, that mutual trade off the land at the beginning, I think that's kind of like the inherent like community and where that, where, where Métis people do blend in with the land here and have a connection to the land here. And, and then, and then building that all the way over here to what we're doing today, you know, when it comes to those miscommunications, when, I, when I'm at work, I'm always teaching people how to communicate to another person, especially in like the healthcare field as, as a person almost like that's kind of what I try to bring into my work every single day, because like, I feel like everybody always wants to solve the problem, you know, it's just more like how we go about solving the problem is what we're here to determine. And sometimes it takes a brainstorm. Sometimes that just takes a draft. First person to have a good idea to bring it to the table, you know, is the, is a, is a great contributor. That's also from our indigenous worldview at the same time. You yeah. Know, which is amazing. Yeah. And, and the, the, everything's connected and interwoven. Totally. I think that's, that's, that's a big one. Like that's actually, I think what drew me, because when I was going through university, I wasn't actually, like, again, knew I was Cree, but I had no intentions of working with First Nations or yeah. community or anything like that. It was just something. Um, but then I took a course on geography of health, which was, I call it epidemiology light. And that year we were looking at the, um, the public health officer's report and it had a chapter on in, uh, Aboriginal health in BC. And I was just blown away by the fact that at that time, and I think unfortunately we're back there, there was, uh, for men, I don't remember what it was for women, but it was like 12 year, uh, life expectancy difference. Oh yeah. And that's between first nations or Aboriginal in general, but then, and the general population. So that's including all our immigrants and everything else. Yeah. 
And, and that just really hit me. And that's, I think that, that was the trigger that got me into the work I'm doing. Oh yeah, totally. That's what keeps me but here it, too. It was the, but and before that though, is like, we were talking about population health and public health and it's just like, okay, there's the, um, and I'm still amazed that it's like, there's a whole department and stuff like that that talks about like the interconnectedness of, it's like, cause if like poverty impacts your health, your education impacts your health, your employment impacts your health, like everything's connected. Um, and so that really resonated. I think that's what pulled me into health and then seeing this other stuff. Um, but I still don't see it much in our, in our mainstream healthcare system. Is, what, what do you mean by that? Uh, it, it's still very, um, silo approach. So it's very diagnosis, go to this. And, um, like for example, my, like my, my, my own personal okay, example, my own personal example is, is that one, like my doctor's like, okay, like blood tests and all these things can't figure out why you're so tired. It's like, you know what, maybe, maybe it's psychological. And so go see a counselor, <laughs> the counselor, like after two sessions, like it's physical, go back to your doctor. And like, nobody's talking to each other. It's just like, it's just these, these, isolated silos and so if and and that's a big part of why I was stuck in my in my bad health though is because I doctor was kind of like uh family doctors like you know what I I know what I know and I know that this is all you need to check out well I start working with my coach and I'd already moved on to a different I moved on to a nurse practitioner at by this point in time but my my coach is like Oh, you've had these, blood. well, get XYZ blood tests as well. And sure enough, it's like, oh, okay, well, there's the markers we've been looking for. Cause right. the, cause the, the doctor's like looking at my thyroid and it's like, well, your thyroid's fine. And that's the only thing, like, that's the only thing it's like, well, no, there's, there's other pieces to the system. And so if we only look at, and, and I think it's fantastic that some people are specialized in one system, so they know it into a depth, but if they don't connect to the rest, it's almost meaningless because we they're still connected and related like so um, more and more research is coming out on the gut mind um, the gut uh, the gut connection to the mind and I, I'm I, I don't know if I personally experienced it but I believe it mm-hmm. it's like if you have a crappy diet and stuff like that it's going to impact your mental health mm-hmm. Uh, some people might get away with eating garbage, like when you're teens, like I could eat like garbage when I was a teenager, yeah. but as you get older or you're more sensitive or whatever things, like when you're not, f- uh, food is fuel. I like, I like that from my CrossFit days. Food is fuel. Good fuel gives you good performance. Yeah. Crappy fuel, crappy performance. Like, food is medicine too. Yeah. Food is medicine. That's yeah. That's the other one I like. Absolutely. I actually never, do you think that there's ever a way that we will be able to have like a, what I'm envisioning in my head right now is like some type of medical system or or tech that can maintain or a database that can maintain that that full level, seeing the human as full in our healthcare system. Do you think we'll ever be able to get there? I think we can now that you said it that way. And then um, I can visualize it now. Well, as you say, there's like uh, on the one hand, I'm like. I, I never say never, even though that's saying never. Um, <laughs> um, I've learned to say never, never to say never because things I've said never about have ended up I've, I've changed. But um, <laughs> become on right now. I guess I'm a little bit cynical of the of the healthcare system, so I'm I'm having a hard time. But I do. But at the same time, it's like uh, I feel like there's a lot of things that like we've we've been like just again as a cult as a society have been catastrophizing and. Then, and then 10, 20 years later, it's not an issue anymore mm-hmm. uh, because we figured somebody's figured something out. Um, and so I do believe it's possible. Um, I think that what, what comes up for me strongly, though, is is, is I think actually the way it, it won't be the system, it'll be the technology will will allow us to, again, starts with me. Mm. So like with your, like my, my, my Garmin watch here with all my, mm. my health stats and, um, capacity to check things at home, but then also connect your blood test, like look at your blood tests and stuff like, like you, we can see our own blood tests within 24 hours of already. So we have access to the information. And so I think, 
I would say the tech, I would, I would expect the technology to support us in supporting ourselves will happen well before the system changes. Yeah. Just because the system and, and it's not nefarious or anything. It's just when you have a lot of people with a lot of different ways of doing things and a lot of different thoughts, it's really hard to shift. Yeah. 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 It's a big boat. It's a big boat to shift. So again, not that's so again, I'm not, I don't want to say that there's some nefarious conspiracy. It's actually one of the things I kind of laugh when I hear conspiracy theories, having been doing a lot of project management. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the challenge it is to get somebody to do like to get people together on towards the project that they all theoretically agree on but don't necessarily agree on how to do it. And it's just like the amount of work. That's why you have project managers is because you have to manage that. Yeah. And so when I hear conspiracy theory, certain conspiracy theories, I'm like, there's no way you could get a group of people. Like, the, that. This like group of, I don't know, 12, I'm, I'm just thinking Battlestar Galactica, 12 Cylons who are <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> taking like <laughs> controlling everything. And, and, and it's like, no, because somebody's not going to do it right. Somebody's not going to, or somebody's going to just want to do it their own way. Like, like no, like it just doesn't work. Like, yeah, life doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah, totally, <laughs> totally. And if you worked in healthcare, you would know for sure. 100%. Yeah. Well, do you want to dedicate the podcast to anybody? I well, I hadn't thought of that, but I'd like it to to dedicate it to my family. Um, that's uh, again, this is a lot of why I do what I do. Um, and then I, and then my, my hope and, and, and such, and I'm already seeing this with, with my daughter and the work she's going is, is that they're going to go into helpful professions. And my, my daughter's going into early childhood education and, um, yeah, our, our kids are our future seven generations. Like that's, that's important work. And well, I'm not saying my boys aren't going to do something too. I'm just not, they're, they're not at a spot where they know where they're doing. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, that's funny. Well, I really appreciate you coming to have uh, coffee or, or water <laughs> with me this morning and uh, to have the sit down and just to connect. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful. And thank you for making the trip out, Jay. It was great to connect. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode with my friend Jay Lambert. Uh, the link to Jay's website will be found in the description of wherever you're a- accessing this from. Uh, please leave a review, a comment, a like, really anything to engage with the podcast. Everything helps. Uh, if you have any feedback, please let us know. We're always dedicated to growing and getting better at this. So um, please let us know if you would like anything changed about the podcast. I hope you have a great day and uh, I hope you have a great week ahead as well. All my relations, love, Riel.